to this edition of the Mayor's Report. I'm Heather Avison, News Director at Somerville Neighborhood News. We're here today at the Cantina Mexicana to talk about Shape Up Somerville and some of the other great things going on around town. So Shape Up Somerville is one of the um, healthy eating, healthy living uh, proposals that the city has going on, 15 years now. A new book has just come out with uh, restaurants, menus, good eating. I'm getting hungry. What's your What's your favorite uh, healthy meal? Uh, I thought you were going to ask me what's my favorite restaurant. I'm not going to put you I in that so position. I'm not going to put I you in that you, position. We are in <laughs> one of my favorites here, La Cantina Mexicana, and I have a strong preference for either uh, el burro desnudo or the. You wouldn't believe it. The chicken soup here is to die for. It's very healthy, very filling. They do a great job. And, and we had a very long, cold, wet summer, right. spring, yeah. so it was great to have some chicken soup available. Absolutely. Um, Tell me about uh, Shape Up Somerville and the uh, the school programs that you've been bringing into the, the schools and, and getting kids well, starting at the beginning. Shape Up Somerville is unique. It is the world's first community-based environmental approach, a systems approach to reversing the trends of childhood obesity and generation. And more than a decade ago, when we partnered with uh, Dr. Christina Economos and Mim Nelson and our partners at the Friedman School of Nutrition at Tufts University to launch this project, we wanted to help cultivate an environment based on policy that would incentivize people to live a healthy lifestyle, to eat more, to play, uh, not eat more, eat well, play hard, or eat smart, play well, move more, and make good choices. But we recognize that as policymakers, our decisions impact systems. The systems around food access and food policy, food security, the access to affordable, healthy foods, um, the act of living and the built environment, the infrastructure of the community, those all collide to cultivate an environment that influenced some consequence. And more than 10 years ago, some of those children, 46% of our school-aged children, were either obese or risk of being obese. There was more than the national ep epidemic, which had tripled in 40 years. So some of them undertook this world initiative, which has impacted how the world thinks about it and, and was the basis for Let's Move, the First Lady, Michelle Obama's approach to ending childhood obesity in a generation. So, and this great restaurant guide is just shows how our partnership with the community, recognizing that we have so many al allies and stakeholders and communities that have to really conquer this adaptive challenge and giving people good, healthy options at their fingertips. And this really helps the restaurants as well think about what can we offer to Somerville residents, how can we be moving in, the, in this direction yeah. as, as well. So. Right, it's about making the healthy choice the easy choice, not just a choice of convenience. So we're excited that the business community recognized and the restaurant community recognized their role in this important public health endeavor. And people can get this guide at City Hall, they can pick yeah, it up. Yeah. Um, uh, at City Hall or, or oh, call okay. City Hall, 617-625-6600, extension 4312, if oh. you'd like to get a guide. Or oh, call 311. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think someone's calling now. <laughs> having Tufts Nutritional School is a huge benefit to Somerville in, in this kind of partnership. I mean, this is a premier nutritional um, school in the world. Well, the Freeman School of Nutrition is world recognized, um, and this type of research does a lot to impact global change on public health initiatives. So, who would have thought a small city of Somerville would spark a worldwide movement to intervene for an intervention on a child at BC to really reverse the negative trends of an entire generation to promote a healthy and give really an entire generation a healthy outlook in their future? Some of us had the opportunity to work with our colleagues across the country and around the globe. Even countries such as Singapore have visited some of them, Massachusetts, to look at shape up some of them to develop their own countrywide or nationwide uh, health policies. Great, and I saw that 85% of elementary school students who tried kale chips this <laughs> spring would try them again. So I just want to say that I did try to yeah. get us some kale chips this afternoon to try and that would be great. I, I came up short but uh, <laughs> well, it's important because you know the, in our schools the school children the teachers the parents of our kids work together to develop menu options pick healthy menu choices to advise uh, our diverse families on how to in a very culturally sensitive way cook their favorite foods in a more healthy way so it really has been a community-based effort and that's what makes it special it's not the mayor 
or any health official telling you you should do this or you need to lose weight. It's about making good policy decisions that incentivize eating smart, playing hard, moving more and living well. And uh, speaking of uh, playing hard, I have to take that into the Green Line Extension project <laughs> and the community path that sure. goes along with it. Um, guarded good news this week from the Department of Transportation. It was very good news uh, this week. Uh, the combined boards, the Fiscal Management Control Board and the MassDOT Board voted to move the Green Line project forward. A necessary step to negotiate a new finance plan based on the project redesign with the Federal Transportation Administration, the federal government, which would allow us to access the almost $1 billion sitting on the, on the table to finish the project. So it's a very important step. Got a little ways to go, but we're getting there. Uh, what was in doubt several months ago is certainly a lot clearer, a lot more positive and constructive, and we you know, should thank uh, MassDOT Secretary Pollack, Governor Baker, and Congress of Capuana, and especially all the stakeholders and activists in this city who have advocated for so many years and have kept up the fight. The Green Line will happen because it is the best transit project on the books in generations of Massachusetts. It received the highest grant, $1 billion ever for a real project of this type because it delivers more than 18 million square feet of new development, more than 30,000 jobs, more than 10,000 units of housing. This is for the entire Commonwealth, not just Somerville. And it adds more than $3 billion of new economic activity to the Commonwealth within the next 25 years. So it more than pays for itself. But of more importance, it delivers environmental justice to some of the most vulnerable and neighborhoods and underserved neighborhoods and environmental justice zones in our corridor uh, that for generations have sucked the poison in off I-93 from all the traffic congestion, which was made worse by the Big D and off Route 28. You know, we deserve this, we need this, but this project, make no mistake, will benefit everybody in Massachusetts. And, and the board, the DOT board and the MBTA board, the Fiscal Control Board, there really seems to be a, a strong level of support for the project. I think I mean, they're trying to, to do what sure. they can, but they have constraints as well. Sure, well, you know, the project, uh, it's under construction today as we speak, but uh, during that, uh, uh, even during that first phase of construction, as they're projecting the next phase, cost of the next phases, uh, they were running close to a billion dollars over budget. The boards have worked uh, closely with the communities in the corridor and stakeholders to rein in those costs through value engineering and rescoping and new procurement methods. And we saw a fantastic presentation by the interim GLX team led by a gentleman named Jack Wright, which showed they've, they've identified almost $700 million worth of savings. When you add the $152 million that will be shifting over from the later phases of the project to initial phases because we need to get out the College Ave in order to do the Route 16 phase, and the unprecedented and extraordinary offer by some of all of $50 million and $25 million from Cambridge, uh, that delta, that gap is around $70 million. We're right there. And the boards recognize the important need of this project. And if we can't do this project in Massachusetts, with all the benefits, with a billion dollars sitting on the table, um, what else could, what could we do? This is a time for Massachusetts to shine. I think everyone recognizes that, which is why Monday's decision was so critical. Yeah. And, a, and a new move towards big projects that Absolutely. we can do. We, should, we need to, if we want to be competitive in the 21st century global economy in this commonwealth, we need a 21st century uh, transportation system to do it, and we need 21st century progressive thinking to accomplish it. And the community path is part of that, is still a, a, a bit of a yeah, you know, we've had tough, tough choices. Tough yeah. walk. Part of the value engineering exercise uh, was understanding certain realities and accepting some unpleasant changes. This, the, the bringing down, value engineering down some of the stations from more elaborate designs to uh, basic service and platforms isn't as nice aesthetically, but important to bring the service out. Same, making the terminus of the community path along with other changes of location at Washington Street and not all the way to Boston is a difficult choice, but a necessary one. And it doesn't preclude from us reaching our ultimate goal in the future, which we will certainly incorporate in our thinking and in the future designs as they de-elevate McGrath Highway and as we develop the inner belt and brick bottom. But the most important thing is we're able to keep a path more than $20 million for a community path in the plan, and we're able to ward off any efforts to take the path out completely, which is important for great accessibility for the broader community, uh, and also for healthy emergency and safe, a healthy Somerville mm -hmm. to more active living and emergency and safety egress. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it, it, that was something I wanted to follow up with you on what you said is bringing, in the, bringing the rest of it in later. I mean, that's the kind of project that might stand on its own sure. at some point in a, in a funding Absolutely. program later on. The Green Line has come through phases. Uh, we, the Commonwealth, which is another compelling argument why this has to be done, has already sunk more than $700 million to bring it to where it is. Uh, and it's, it's been years of advocacy and, and phasing in the project, and we build these stops all the way up to College Ave, including Union Square, the path as is presently designed. We're, we're right in the thick of it, really close to our ultimate goal, and we'll get there. So this summer, summer's here, weather's improving. Oh. Um, what are you looking forward to for the summer here? You know, I love everything about the spring and summer, all year round about summer, but this time of year, you know, as we just had open studios and Porch Fest will be coming in, we have the Memorial Day Parade and the fireworks, but all the arts and civic events around the city from Art Beat to Arts Union to uh, Summer Streets. It's just a great time to be in the city. I mean, it's such farmers an market. The farmers might, the, the, it's just the social in power and the social capital of people connecting with one another, celebrating civic life and urban life in Somerville. I, I tell you, I love it. It's great to be around. It. Uh, you know, summer in the city is really cool too. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I like all the seasons here. And now, so here we are, spring into summer means Somerville High School graduates. Um, let's talk a little bit about the new high school design. Right. Um, finding open space in Somerville isn't easy <laughs> for anything, and it looks like they've come up with a unique way yeah. to use space that's there and create new space. If people go to the city's website, and uh, you can follow the links to the High School Building Committee's website, and there were several options examined by the High School Building Committee, which is formed according to the regulations of the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Uh, the present uh, uh, preferred design called 4B sites at Manual High School near on Central Hill in between the main high school and the library. But it does some unique things and one of the, the, the add-ons they would like to see as we develop the parking structures create some open space on the top of that parking structure in between City Hall as you're going down to the future Gilman Square Green Line Station, which is important because we are the most densely populated city in New England. One of our summer vision goals is to create 125 acres of new open space uh, by 2030. We don't have a lot of land in the city, right. not to mention it's not only difficult to build parks, but to build a new high school yeah. <laughs> out of the several sites and I options they looked at. Fascinating and the fascinating use of, of space right. as they're really creating right. open space on top of a right, and, and, and it creates and some hill. challenges. You know, staging such a project and financing such a project, mm -hmm. building such major construction projects in the inner core is expensive. When you're setting it on the hill, it, it drives the cost. But a new high school is critical for the future of our education programming. It's not about building luxury. It's not a, uh, It's not about just building a structure for the sake of building it. The main high school is in, has, was originally built in the late 1800s. The east and west wings in 1920s, uh, and the present high school as is just on the north wall alone has approximately twenty million dollars worth of exterior maintenance needed. Uh, but we not just it's beyond the bricks and mortar. We need to build a school that allows for twenty first century learning. Uh, the type of community based innovative learning that we that really embodies all the magic, all the creativity and innovation and originality that is in some of it from the maker fabrication, artisan, the, the tech and green technology movement happening right here, uh, connecting our community to that type of activity, our students exposing them to that experiential learning and bringing it into a new building that allows for that new educational program to happen. We cannot do it with a simple code of paint or code upgrade to the present building. But the finance of such a project will be challenging and any major construction project of that magnitude will cause us to do something we haven't done ever in some way. That's to go to the taxpayers and ask for a debt exclusion or override a two and a half to get it done. So stay tuned. One of the activities this summer will be to explain that to the public. Mm -hmm. If it's this desire to further education to the, of this community to further education into the 21st century uh, to a degree that is unmatched in the Commonwealth, well then we need to do this and we need to have that conversation. But the, the high school project in Somerville is in the pipeline um, for funding. Through the, um, we're in the midst of uh, we're, we're at actually about to complete our feasibility analysis, which we received more than two million dollars from the Massachusetts School Building Authority to finance that. We would then have a plan that they must approve, and the financing plan would include a match of up to almost 80 percent of the Massachusetts School Building Authority towards eligible costs. But when you net it out, it's probably about 
50% of the total. Uh, but that has to be matched with a city side amount. Where does the money come sure. from? And we need to be cognizant and recognize that we have a lot of capital needs in the city. Infrastructure needs that are critical to our quality of life, to our economy, to our way of living, to our future. High school is certainly one of them. And how we finance that must be, must be embodied in that. So over the next few months, we'll go to the Board of Aldermen and the public over the next several months to ask them for their support for such a project. We need to get this done. And there is a class of Somerville High School seniors graduating yeah. in early June. Close to my heart. And they were just entering <laughs> kindergarten. Seems you like you were just there. I then became mayor. You know, I became mayor in 2004. So they were just entering the schools when uh, you know I um, I became mayor. And uh, it's there's a lot of uh, for me a, a a certain bond with this class. Uh, you look and think of a, a new generation of kids coming through our. Uh, our school system and there's so much for them to hope for and they I think they really embody so much that's special about some of our diversity again our creativity our originality and my message to them would be you know approach the world with a passion for curious curiosity and a willingness to be abnormal to be, to be abnormal abnormal I think that's I like what's special that. about some of them I like that very taking much. the smart risks are yep. important yep take a risk you're never gonna right. get Chase ahead if you dreams. don't Right. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank we'll you. be uh, looking for you in the city at all of the festivals we'll be this around summer. the city this spring and summer. <laughs> Look for us. Yeah. Out in the streets with the music. Thank you very much for joining us today on Mayor's Report. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. See you.